Hey everybody, it's your girl Tawana B with Not Your Normal Conversation. How's everybody doing this evening? Thank you for joining us. Tonight we have Saheed. And before we started this interview, I asked him to pronounce his last name because I don't want to butcher it. So Saheed, why don't you just tell us your last name just so they know. Abdi Kareem. Thank you, Tawana. Oh, you're welcome. And thank you for you know, not making me look bad by not being able to pronounce your last name. I'm very sorry about that. So this is Saheed. He's running for Boston City Council at large. He's one of the candidates. And I, I invited him to the show because I, again, as I said, every time you see me bring a candidate here, it's important for us to know who's running for these seats and what community and why. So I brought Saheed here tonight and he's, he's been great thus far and putting up with me, he has to do, be great because you know, I'm a whole bunch. So I like to start off by having him just introduce himself and tell us who he is and why he's running. Thank you very much, Tawana, for having me on the show, the podcast. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, my name is Saeed Abdi Kareem. Um, I lived in Boston for about 28 years. Mm -hmm. um, when I first came to Boston, I was resettled here as a refugee um, from Africa. Mm -hmm. I went through the uh, Boston public school system from elementary um, to high school. I lived in uh, various um, public housing throughout Boston. Um, Boston is my home. Nice. I, I am a diehard, any sports uh, Boston fan. Glad to be here tonight. Thank you. So see, we're just going to jump right into the interview because I don't want anybody to miss anything. And I was saying this before we started the, the live that you have a a nice pedigree. You, you come from a great background from some, for someone who comes from Africa um, and has been here for 28 years. Um, you, you've been through the Boston public school system from elementary school to high school. And again, like you have an impressive resume. Um, you worked at Apple, Fidelity Investments, Harvard University, and then you've done some work in the community in housing, violence against women, substance abuse, and women empowerment. Am I right about that? So speak to me a little bit about the work that you've done in the community. I'm sorry, uh, you, you kind of broke up a little bit. Can I'm you, sorry, I think, I think you, um, you kind of froze there, no problem. So I said, just if you can speak to our audience about the work that you've done in the community with you know, housing and violence and substance abuse and women empowerment, can you speak to, to the viewers as to what you've been doing in the community? Absolutely. Um, thank you for touching up on my background. Uh, one of the first things that I did um, in collaboration with community organizations, um, you know, with high schools is I volunteer to teach, um, you know, technical skills, right. to kids that come from low income communities. Um, basically, uh, you know, I would go to after school programs and I would work with them, um, you know, talking about the different, um, you know, fields in technology. Mm -hmm. uh, also, I would work with uh, community organizations. Uh, in developing a, you know, technology curriculum, um, you know, as part of their, you know, uh, mission. Um, also, you know, I, I invest in women empowerment. Right. Um, you know, if there's a, a minority um, woman entrepreneur in Boston and um, her information gets to my desk, um, you know, more than likely I would put in money without asking anything in return. Right. Uh, also, I did some work back in Africa um, you know, investing in women, helping them, you know, start businesses, mm -hmm. um, you know, in terms of the, um, you know, the violence and the substance abuse, I have a personal experience, right. um, lost two friends, uh, in Boston, one of them to gun violence. Um, you know, he was shot five times for no reason. Um, and I lost another friend to, uh, substance abuse. Um, he died of a drug overdose. So, right. you know, when it comes to violence and substance abuse, it's very personal for me. Right. Uh, you know, I always talk to kids uh, and, and try to work with them and, you know, let them know that, you know, there is there is help out there because, you know, when people ask me about our policies, my policies about, you know, gun violence, substance abuse, it, it's not a, a, a one fixed solution because there are so many competing factors, factors, right. you know, a kid can come from a uh, single parent home. Um, you know, they can have a mental illness, 
Right. You know, they could be dealing with trauma. Um, so, you, you know, you, you just can't base, you know, things that are, you know, a competing factors on the one policy. Right. So um, I'm hoping, um, you know, with the work that I've done in the community that if elected as a city council at large, I can use my personal experience to find resources because people uh, need resources. Of course. You know, there are community organizations uh, within the low income community, the minority community that advocate and, and work, you know, in solving gun violence and, and substance abuse, but they need the resources and, and they don't have the resources because of the city budget. Yeah. Right. So, you know, you said that you've lived in Boston public housing and you know that we, we have many crises in the community, the pandemic, the epidemic, um, people in small businesses in the community that don't have enough money to keep running because of the pandemic and sometimes even because of the epidemic. I know there's been stores that have been closed down because sometimes there are addicts that will go into the store and steal a lot of things because they're hungry or they're homeless. And, you know, I, I found a lot of times that people who sit in either the seats for Boston City Council or if they sit in the state house or wherever they're sitting, sometimes it's not that they don't see these things, it's that they ignore these things. But this is a big responsibility for someone to sit in this seat. And it's very hard to ignore what's going on in our community, what's going on down in Mass Ave. Because I was just driving, I was in Brockton and I drove and a lady had her whole mattress outside under a bridge with a bedspread and all of her belongings. And it actually broke my heart to see that. And I see more of it as I get closer to driving into Boston near South Bay where the prison is, I see a lot of this homelessness. And I wondered how you plan to attack that issue alone. Um, you know, having affordable housing, having access to a suitable, um, you know, housing is a human right. Right. Um, I believe no human being, especially in a city as big as Boston, Right. Uh, with a lot of resources, no one should be homeless. No one. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, the issues that, you know, Boston's facing with affordable housing, um, it, it's a set of, um, you know, competing factors. One, it has to do with zoning. Right. Um, you know, we have restrictive zoning that doesn't allow for new, new developments. And if you don't have new developments, that means you know, you're not going to meet the demand of affordable housing. And also, um, I am for to increase the affordable housing units uh, right. and developments that are already being developed to increase the number, um, you know, because, you know, the population in Boston, if, if we don't meet the demand for affordable housing, we're going to have a lot of people that are homeless. We're going to have, you know, um, for example, you can have a single mother who is living in Boston, who is forced to move outside of Boston now right. uh, because she can't afford to live here. So that creates other issues. Right. And those issues could be, she, she has to drive into work. Mm -hmm. um, she's not gonna find daycare for her children. She's, ha she's gonna have to pay um, you know, a lot of money in terms of like commuting to Boston, whether it is um, public transportation or whether it is you know, driving a car. She has to pay extra gas, travel extra miles. So you know, the housing crisis, it's something, it's, it's part of one of our top three policies mm -hmm. uh, to, to create more affordable housing. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it's gonna take a collaborative effort. Um, you know, to be honest with you, if elected, I'm not gonna say, I'm gonna get to city hall and change everything. Because as you know, po politics is very tricky. You have to have colleagues right. that agree with you on your legislation. Right. But, I come from a numbers background, so I'm hoping to use my analytical skills to show, you know, my colleagues, you know, uh, at the city level and at the state level, like, you know, this is what's going on and this is how, how we can target the issues and hopefully they will listen. Right. So what do you say to the people that look, because when I got your background, I, I was impressed. Thank you. Anybody would be. But we see a lot of politicians like this who have this background. And I was speaking to you about this in private earlier about politicians and community activists, because I think it's gonna take 
a community activist to fill the seat as opposed to a politician. We've had many politicians that sit in these seats and that pay for commercials and pay for airtime and pay for those things, but they're not sincere or genuine about what they plan to do once they get in that seat. So I, I looked at your background and I, I can see that you're very smart. So that's the first thing. So strategically, you've got it all figured out because you did say you're a numbers guy. So you know how to attack these issues by showing people what the numbers are and what they could and project what the numbers could look like in the next two years if we don't do something about a lot of the issues here in the community. But what do you say to people who are just meeting you, don't really know much about your campaign? How do you assure them that you are the right person to sit in the seat? Because again, if I looked at this background, I would definitely say, yeah, okay, he has every all the qualifications that people would usually vote for. But to me, in this day and age especially, and I'm seeing what's going on, there's many crises in the communities. It's gonna take more than somebody who has this type of resume. It's gonna take somebody who's a real community activist and is not gonna mind rolling up their sleeves and walking in there and saying, hey, listen, this can't happen. Our community is suffering. And we are not just, at the bottom of the barrel, we're underneath the barrel. So how, if you get the seat, how are you gonna bring us up? How are you gonna change the narrative of what's been happening in the community? Not just for years, but for decades and long before you. Uh, great question. So um, our team, I would like to start off uh, mentioning our team. Sure. Um, our team consists of um, practitioners, people, that have lived the issues that you know we're trying to fight for. For mm -hmm. example, um, you know, Ms. Lisa Searcy, she is one of our policy advisors. Right. And um, you know, because the thing is, uh, you know, we can find someone from outside of Boston to work on our team, but they never lived the issues. They're not, you know, Bostonians, they never lived in public housing, they never experienced trauma. Right. Um, one area that you know we're trying to show to voters is that. You know, we have people on our team that are actually practitioners, people that live these issues. Right. Um, secondly, um, you know, by the way, I, I'm not smart. I, I just work hard and I got lucky. Um, so I know, beg so, to differ. I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Uh, you know, secondly, uh, you're right. People might say, you know, Saeed, um, you know, you come from a numbers background. You have this great resume. But at the same time, um, I lived these issues. Right. Um, you know, I lived in public housing. I, I know what it felt like to be, you know, poor, um, underserved. Because, you know, when I when I was living in the in the um, you know public housing projects um, as a kid, I remember we lacked a lot of resources. Yeah. We were not taught STEM education at an early age. Um, you know. So when I look back now, and and I say to myself. You know, imagine if we had this back then at our community center. Um, right. A lot of us, you know, probably could have worked for NASA. A lot of us could have been, you know, working for, um, you know, Google, Facebook, et cetera. Right. So having that personal connection, having that emotional connection, and um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, losing to friends uh, to gun violence and substance abuse, you know, that those things also are going to help me. You know, because sometimes, you know, you are right. You don't want to just think from a numbers perspective all the time. You have to have that human side, that human right. connection. Right. And it's there for me. Um, and it's not like, you know, I haven't been in the community um, just because I didn't advertise on, on, you know, on social media, like, hey, I did this for th this young man. I did this for this community organization. Right. That doesn't mean that I haven't been there. Right. Time will tell. Um, a lot of the community members will come out in, in support of our campaign right. and talk about who really Saeed is. Right. Yes. Right. So you spoke on something and I spoke on something about you that has been pretty impressive, but is lacking in our community and that's education. So in the black and brown community, Dorchester, Roxbury, Manapan, we find that we have the MECO program. That's the closest we ever get to having great education for our children unless we have enough money to afford for them to go to private school or maybe a charter school. But at the end of the day, MECO is only house, is only busing our children out to schools that are public schools so that we can get a great education. How do you plan to attack that issue that we should have these schools in our area so that we're not getting our kids up at four o'clock in the morning to go to a bus stop to be bus all the way an hour away just to have the education that we should have right in our backyard. 
Um, you know, Boston Public Schools, um, you know, in my opinion, are underfunded. Um, you know, they, they don't have the funding. Um, you know, that's why, you know, you have great schools like the Madison Park, uh, you know, which should be the gold standard for all vocational schools in New England. Right. Uh, you know, it's not, you know, at the level that it needs to be. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's, you know, as I mentioned earlier, uh, when it comes to, you know, revenue and funding, um, you know, even at the city level, you, you are restricted because the state controls a lot of things. Of um, a lot of the funding comes from the state in terms of, uh, you know, the budgeting for the education. But we need, um, you know, especially during this pandemic, we need to provide, um, you know, the funding and the resources so our students, um, you know, don't have to be bused outside of Boston to get a quality education. Right. We have quality education here in Boston because, you know, we do have, you know, quality teachers. Mm -hmm. It's just that they're lacking the resources and support. And um, um, I will push for um, STEM education, vocational education, because um, I, I believe that, you know, that's one of the areas that if we target and resource, right. um, it's going to bridge the wealth gap. Because the thing is, um, you know, affordable housing is great for families that are starting off now. Yes. It's going to help them to get on their feet. Mm -hmm. But you don't want generation after generation to be on affordable housing. You want to equip people with the right skills so that they can get higher paying jobs. That's going to allow them to buy a house. Right. That's going to allow them to buy a business. It all comes down to public education. Right. And we incorporate, um, you know, STEM, vocational, um, and even, even farming, because um, a lot of our, in the low-income communities, we lack healthy food access. Right. And if we can teach our kids at an early age how to farm, how to be self-sufficient, that's going to help them in the long run. I'll take that. <laughs> Thank you. What do you think about defunding the police? Because I've spoken to many people, and I think sometimes the community doesn't really know what that consists of, what defunding the police consists of. Um, how do you feel about that issue and what the community is trying to do as far as saying some of the funds that go to the Boston police as far as they're doing details, like they're on Mass Ave and there's still a lot of stabbings and fightings and, and fighting and things going on in different places and they just stay in their cars. They don't get out, they don't break it up. They, they do nothing, they just sit there. It's a waste of taxpayers' dollars. So what do you think about this campaign for defunding the police? Uh, so the question, I want to make sure I understand the question very correctly. Mm -hmm. Or are you asking me if we need to allocate some of the police budget to other areas? I, I'm asking you if you think that allocating some of the police budget to other areas, do you think that that's necessary or do you think it's something that should be happening? Absolutely. 100%. Um, I do agree that we need to allocate some of the Boston police um, you know, budget to other areas such as, um, you know, help with mental health, right. um, such as, um, you know, help with substance abuse, right. and even educational services to teach Absolutely. our young kids at an early age uh, to stay away from the criminal justice system. Absolutely. And, and I, I concur with staying away from the criminal justice system. But a lot of times people do not know what defunding the police means. They think that it means taking all funds away from them so that we have no more police. That's not what this is about. It's more about allocating our funds so that we can make good use of them in the community for people who are really struggling. That's yeah. what it means to me. What do you think about them trying to build another prison here? Um, I I don't think we need another prison um, because, you know, we, we need to hire more, um, you know, workers, mental health workers. Mm -hmm. We need to hire more, um, you know, public health workers. Yes. Um, to create programs um, to teach students, our kids at an early age, how to navigate the criminal justice system, how to stay away from the criminal justice system, how to deal with um, you know, law enforcement. And the people that are already in the criminal justice system, 
Um, you know, they need reentry programs that's going to help them, you know, to get back in society, you know, um, and, and, and learn new skills to, to stay away from prisons. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So I, I am against the idea of building a new prison um, here in Boston or anywhere close to Boston. Absolutely. So if you had to speak to a, a community of people and tell them what your campaign is really targeting, because everyone has their slogan or their campaign and what they're trying to do to change everything that came before them. Because I, I think a lot of times our communities look at people and they expect you to be the savior. They expect you to go in and they expect you to change everything without really understanding that there's probably someone standing in front of you blocking you from doing the very thing that you said that you may be able to do. And I think that that probably happens a lot. There's a lot of people who have good intentions until they get in and they find out that it's something that's not obtainable at the moment. So if you're going to speak to people that are potentially voting for you, what would you say about your campaign and how do you plan to, to attack these issues once you do get this, if you get the seat, how do you plan to attack issues that are going to be, sometimes they're going to be hard to overcome. Sometimes you may not be able to do them. And people may try to hold you accountable to something that really is not in your control. And how are you going to handle that? Great question. So um, our campaign theme is based on let's make Boston equally skillful. Um, because if you give people the right skills, mm -hmm. um, um, you know, for you know, skills in the 21st century. It could be in technology, it could be in vocational, it could be in farming. Right. That means you're making that individual learn how to be self-sufficient. Absolutely. Um, because nowadays, not every kid wants to go to college. Um, True. You know, some kids just want to graduate high school and they want to get into the workforce. Right. Um, so how are we going to make Boston equally skillful that's going to allow people to have the skills, um, as I mentioned earlier, to have a high paying job, you know, to buy a house, you know, to start a business, et cetera. Right. Um, also, you know, when I say equally skillful, it, it doesn't have to be skills relating to a job. It could be financial literacy. Right. Um, you know, if you teach someone how to build good credit, mm -hmm. um, if you teach them, um, you, know, you know, how to invest money, um, also, you're teaching that person how to be self-sufficient. Right. Um, you know, it could be skills in how to navigate the criminal justice system, how to right. stay away from the criminal justice system. Right. Uh, because, you know, I remember there were programs when I was growing up here in Boston where law enforcement would come and they would talk to us about, you know, uh, how to deal with law enforcement if you get pulled, if you get pulled over, if you get accused of something. Right. Um, you know, how to deal with the police, which were great because you had law enforcement in the community talking to people. Um, I, I think we need to continue those programs and other programs as like public health, um, you know, how to teach kids, you know, to stay away from drugs, right. or what, you know, drugs do to people. Mm -hmm. uh, because nowadays it seems like, you know, our young children are, you know, falling trapped to what they see on TV, you know, the yes. entertainers, um, you know, they, they don't understand the re repercussions of, um, you know, taking a certain drug and what it can do to your body. Right. Um, so we want to build an equally skillful Boston. Um, right. Let's get back to education. Um, you, you know, uh, for example, um, the exam schools, right? You have um, a lot of kids from low income communities that don't have the, that are smart, but right. they don't have the opportunity to go to exam schools because to get into an exam school, first, you have to have the resources to study for the exam. You have to have tutors and um, or you have to have parents that understand what the exam schools are about. Right. But they, but they don't. But right. they have a smart kid at home, but the parents don't understand how to navigate the system. Right. So not only students, we need to create equally skillful parents. Right. Community leaders, mm -hmm. um, you know, that would know how to fight for the right res resources of Bostonians, especially those of um, you know low income communities. Right. Um, that's what our campaign theme is about: is creating equally skillful Boston, um, you know, Bostonians, mm -hmm. uh, fighting for affordable housing, um, fighting for the environment. Because if you go down 
Mass Ave, or if you go down to any of the parks here on Millennium Cast, mm -hmm. you will find needles on the street, on, on some of these parks, right. you know, on the streets. Um, so we, we need to be mindful of our environment and how can we create the resources to give people jobs to, you know, clean these parks, to keep the community clean, um, you know, to work with the youth, um, et cetera. How accessible will you make yourself to the communities that you're representing, to the people that are gonna probably call your office or email you or reach out to you? Because a lot of times we vote somebody in and then we can never get a hold of them after that. So how accessible do you plan to make yourself to the community if you are elected for this chair? I plan to make myself uh, very, very accessible. And I am gonna promise this, I know this is live, uh, if I get the opportunity to be your next Boston City Council large, I promise to be very accessible. Um, you know, I promise to hold uh, community uh, town halls. I promise to hold, um, you know, uh, office hours. Right. So my goal is to be as, you know, as accessible as possible. Okay. So what do you think about the community being able to access City Hall? and being able to, what do you think about that? The community has the right. Bostonians have the right, uh, whether you're at large or you're a, a district, uh, you know, counselor. Of course. People voted for you. Uh, right. You know, people gave um, their hard earned money to your campaign. So they deserve to have access to you as much as possible. Okay. Uh, City Hall needs to be accessible to the community. Um, you know, there needs to be a specific, um, you know, office where people can just come in, uh, walk in hours, they can make an appointment. Um, you know, politicians, you know, should not, you know, um, take lightly uh, for voters that voted for them. Right. And, you know, that gave them, you know, donations. Absolutely not. Okay. So what do you, how do you plan to attack the issue of immigration and ICE? Because You've been here for 28 years, and I'm sure you're older than 28 years old. Yes. No disrespect, because I'm I, a lot I, older than 28 too. But how do you plan to address this issue? Because this is another big issue within our communities. There are a lot of immigrants who've come here to have a better life for their children and for their families and to grow their families. And we see a lot of what's on the news. Children are separated from their parents. How do you plan to attack this issue, which is to me just as big as a pandemic? It's a growing issue and it's getting bigger by the minute. Great question. Uh, recently, I had to fill out a questionnaire for one of the uh, progressive groups here in Boston and they did ask that question about immigration and ICE. Okay. Um, so um, ICE, first of all, ICE should not have access to student record at any public schools. Absolutely. Yes. And, um, you know, if, if I have the opportunity to serve as a uh, Boston City Council at large, also, I would push for and advocate against Boston police working with ICE or Boston police doing any immigration checks on anybody that they encounter or anybody that they pull over. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, Boston is a sanctuary city. Yes. Uh, it needs to stay that way. Um, you know, uh, as an immigrant, someone that came here as a refugee, um, you know, I would say that um, the immigrant community is totally, you know, against um, any collaboration, um, you know, with ICE. Right. And, uh, you know, we, we need to keep it that way. We, we need to keep uh, our immigrant our, keep our immigrant community, um, you know, safe from any harassment, um, from any intimidation, and hopefully, um, you know, I could use my background as an immigrant to to push that forward uh, in City Hall. Absolutely, and I kind of spoke to you about this briefly before we started this interview. You know, just as a, my own personal experience, what do you plan to do about quarries, background checks? You know. For me, it, it's very personal because as you know, I'm formerly incarcerated, but more importantly, when someone is willing to start their life over and do the right thing and they've done time or they finished probation, this quarry seems to follow you like a GPS. It's like a tracking system. So when you go to a job that you could be highly qualified for, 
someone has the right to say and almost convict you all over again of a crime that you've already been sentenced on or you've been convicted of and you've moved on with your life, but it still follows you. And what type of system would you create so that this isn't something that, because you know, in our communities, a lot of people do have quarries. And this is what hinders a lot of people from moving forward with their life when they're trying to do, it, it could be five years to seven years. How do you plan to address that issue? Uh, first of all, Tawana, I would like to say thank you very much for sharing your inspiring story, um, you know, life's background with me. Um, you know, every human being that's born um, does not wake up one day and say, I'm going to go ahead and do these activities that right. are, you know, against the law. Right. There, there are family issues. There are psychological issues. Right. There are trauma issues for a person to, um, you know, not be a law abiding citizen. Right. Um, I do believe a hundred percent in second chances. Every human being will make mistakes. Right. Um, you know, as long as that person is showing progress, mm -hmm. as long as that per person is working towards, you know, improving their lives and improving the lives of the communities or, or community members, right. absolutely that person should get a second chance. Um, we should not hold people's past against them in order to make progress because, um, you know, you're not doing any justice uh, to Bostonians or you're not doing any justice to society if you're holding back someone who made a mistake 5, 10, 20 years ago right. and, and you know, they're, they're trying to get your life on track. You're not doing any, any justice. Absolutely. Um, I do believe in second chances and I do believe um you know we we need to revisit uh you know the quarry policies that we have in place right now and um um you know make it better give people second chances give people second opportunities and uh don't use their past against them absolutely i i agree with that probably more than a lot of people since i've experienced a lot of it recently but you touched on mental health earlier and that's another big thing that's going on a lot of times you see people down in the South Bay area, they don't just have drug addictions, they have mental illness or they, they're veterans and they have no, how do you plan to attack mental? Because a lot of times I know personally for me, I've seen a lot of people incarcerated who have mental health issues, who don't belong in jail, they belong in other institutions. But a lot of times the system is so bogged down with so many different people that they don't separate them. They just throw them all in the pot and, and hope for the best. How do you plan to attack the mental health crisis? And I see a lot of homeless veterans. They need some type of attention more than the average person who is just out there just doing things sometimes maybe just to be doing them but these people are now thrown into a system and they're lost within the system where they're not getting the right treatment they're not getting the mental health that they need none of those things are happening so how do you plan to address that issue because it's a big issue uh yes it is i i, I agree 100 percent um that's why i mentioned earlier uh we need to allocate some of the police budget towards um you know, um, funding um, other areas of public health. Right. Um, we need to have more of, um, you know, public health experts than um, law enforcement dealing with people that, uh, you know, could be in, on methadone mile, could be on mass app, could be anywhere in Boston mm -hmm. that are dealing with the trauma of mental health. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to have, uh, you know, public health workers out there uh, you know, doing the research, doing the legwork, talking to these people, because sometimes, you know, when I'm walking around Boston, uh, especially in the massive area, um, I stop and I talk to people. Right. Uh, sometimes I get personal with them if they're okay with it. And I say, you know, right. do you mind if I ask you, um, you know, how did you get to this, you, you know, level in life? Um, right. You know, what happened? And um, I would say 95% of the people, they're open, you know, they talk right. to me and they say, you know, I had a family issue, um, you know, either I was in the military, um, you know, I experienced some sort of a trauma and um, that gets to me. And, and, they, and, I, and I sometimes ask them, you know, what kind of help do you need? Right. And they say, 
Um, you know, I, I, you know, we wish we had, um, you know, two, they say two things. They say we wish we had someone at an early age that was a mentor right. that, you know, sort of, you know, showed us, you know, to do the right thing in life. Right. And secondly, they say, you know, we wish you currently have people, um, you know, from the, uh, the, the health field, you know, come to us and, and talk to us and help us out. And um, we should not, um, you know, every human being is, you know, deserves help, but we should not have our veterans out there suffering right. and dealing with mental health. We should not have our, our veterans, you know, being arrested because, you know, they're out there in methadone mild. Absolutely not. So we need to have more uh, public health workers right. and less of police, you know, dealing with, you know, people that are experiencing, um, you know, mental health issues. Absolutely. Now, if you don't win this election, do you plan on still serving the community? I think I've asked everybody that I've interviewed that question because I see great things happening for everybody that is running for a seat in Boston City Council. But again, as I said to them, and I'll say it to you, the work doesn't stop if you don't get elected because together you are a village that can move mountains for this community. And you all have different campaigns and come from different places in your life, different struggles, different situations that would make you a force to be reckoned with even if you don't take this seat. So will you stop doing the work that you're doing in the community if you don't take this seat? Absolutely not. I'm going to continue to do the work. Um, you know, we do have uh, projects that I've been working on for the past two years that are coming down the pipeline. Um, I can share some of them with you. One of them is called, um, you know, prison to programming. Wow. Um, creating a, a boot camp program to teach, um, you know, uh, people that have been in the criminal justice system mm -hmm. um, to learn about technology to learn about, you know, uh, coding yeah. and um, hopefully, you know, to get uh, internships and jobs, um, you know, with technological uh, companies or any company in Boston that, that's willing to hire them. Mm -hmm. um, so for the past two years, um, I've been trying to build an opportunity center um, in, in, in Dudley and then COVID happened. So, you know, that kind of slowed us down. Right. And uh, one day, you know, I'm sitting uh, you know, at the center, I'm thinking, and I'm like, you know, COVID disturbed a lot of things. You know, how can you reinvent the wheel or reinvent this project? Right. Long story short, we are creating a, we're buying a uh, food truck and we're going to turn it into, it's called the opportunity truck. Wow. Uh, we're going to put um, flat screen TVs um, on, on both ends of the truck. And we're going to be stationed at different neighborhoods in Boston, especially the summer. Um, you know, we're going to teach kids about how to create a resume, you know, public speaking, the different technological fields. And also we're going to help adults. For example, you might come to me and say, Saeed, I need help with my resume. I'll tell you, okay, Tawana, I'll help you out. But guess what? If you're not a registered voter, you have to register to vote, then I can help you. Oh, wow. Yes. So it's like a give and take. It's it, you're still helping them get to the next level because a lot of times people in our communities of black and brown, we don't think that our votes matter. So a lot of people don't vote. Why? Well, we'll complain about things, but we won't do what the, take the necessary steps to, to get to where we need to be as a community. Yes. And I think that's our greatest challenge. You know, I always tell people we matter. We do count. Our votes count. What we say matters. We just have to elect the right people in these seats to elevate our voices, to listen to what we're saying, to take down, take notes on what we're talking about. I think that the biggest challenge that a lot of people face, especially sitting in those seats, is that they may not be able to do all the things that they said they were going to do coming into this race. And that can be very difficult for a lot of people in the community to swallow. They want everything done at once. We feel like we've been behind the eight ball for a long time. So we want you to run and catch up for us. But that's not necessarily the way things work. So this is why I use this platform to speak to people like you, because I want the community to understand that in order for us to get ahead, we have to come together and we have to stand behind the person who's representing our community, no matter who it is. 
We can't sit on our hands and ask them to fix our children. It starts in our home. And then if it gets outside of the home, that's when we're going to the people that represent our community and we're saying, hey, listen, we need help. But until then, we have to do our part in order for that person to do their part. If someone was gonna vote, if we were all gonna go to the polls tomorrow and vote for all the Boston City Council, District 4, District 7, Boston City Council at large, what would be the one thing that you would say about yourself that would make people say, okay, I'm going to vote for him? Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, I'm trying to create uh -huh. Go ahead, I'm an, listening. E an equally skillful Boston. Uh -huh. And um, you know, I come from a numbers background. Um, that's really going to help our uh, constituents and Bostonians, um, you know, see because numbers tell the story. Absolutely. Anybody can tell you anything, but if you follow the trail of the numbers, the true story comes out. Um, so obviously, if I'm going to be fighting for any legislation or any resource, I'm going to say X and y, X, Y, and Z. These are the numbers. Right. This is why this community is this way. This is why this community is behind. This is why our kids are behind when it comes to technology, you know, vocational skills. This is why we're having, um, you know, a lot of incarcerations when you can have, uh, you know, mental health professionals. Um, you know, this is why we're having um, shortage of affordable housing. Right. So, it, you know, I would hope that, you know, Bostonians would vote for me because I bring a unique set of skills. There has not been anyone at City Hall that, that comes from a numbers background. Um, not to take away anything from all the other um, politicians we had. Right. And if you ask me, they were all great. And every politician that's cur currently in, in, in City Hall or running, um, they're running because they see need for change. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm not gonna take anything away from them because they bring a unique set of skills. But these are the skills that Bostonians need today because they need someone that can crunch the numbers and tell them, you know, this is the issues that our communities are having. They don't need someone that would say, you know, um, and this is why this is happening, but they don't have the, the background to, you know, to, to, to back it up. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I want a, a level playing field for all Bostonians. Absolutely. People that are skillful, the people that know how to navigate the system, uh, you know, people that know how to advocate for their communities and, and, and for their families. Absolutely. So that, that's what I would tell um, voters. Um, choose the guy with the orange shirt that has the numbers background. <laughs> okay. Yes. So I would like to have you back on the show to do a town hall. I think it's important that people ask you questions. I think it's important that people get to know you on a personal level. They get to ask you questions. You get to answer. And I just would sit there and moderate the meeting. I'd love to have you back. And as I said to other people that are running, I'd like to have a big debate. I, th I think I'm capable of doing that at this point. I think that we need to have these things. I think that we need to put something in place where people can see the people that are running for Boston City Council on every level. This is the only way we're gonna make the right decision for our community so we can come from behind the eight ball. It's important at this point. So many things are happening. We're in the middle of a pandemic. We're in the middle of an epidemic. We're in the middle of homelessness. We're in the middle of gang and gun violence, still in the middle of a pandemic. 74 year old woman got shot and killed just sitting on her porch enjoying a nice day. These are the things that we can't have happening in order for us to win. And I'm sure that the reason why you're running for the seat is because you feel like it's time for our communities to win. Absolutely. So I'd like to have you back for a town hall so that some people can speak to you and voice how they feel about things that are happening in the community and what you plan to do to make a difference or to change those things for them. Because we're looking for some hope. I, I feel like we all, we, we're all looking for oxygen. We all need an oxygen tank. And whoever's running and gets that seat is gonna be our oxygen tank because we need it. We need more than a lifeline at this point. Things have been going on for way too long. Black businesses are struggling in the community. There's a lot of things that are happening that shouldn't be happening. So I just really want to give everybody a voice to say, hey, listen, this is who I am. This is what I stand for. And this is why you should vote for me. 
that makes sense. And you can use my platform. You don't have to have money to do that. Everyone needs to be heard. So thank you for joining us tonight, Saeed. I really appreciate your time. I thank you for speaking out about who you are and what your campaign is about. And I look forward to doing this town hall with you. And um, you seem very relaxed sitting there. So I I'm glad I didn't scare you off. <laughs> you know, I, I took it easy on you. I, <laughs> I had to unmute. <laughs> <laughs> I took it easy on you, Seed. So don't worry, because she was here. She she's a bully, so I didn't want to have any problems with her. So I just don't you know, get it. I, I I mean, you were great, and I appreciate your time and your effort, and I appreciate you being a community activist and being in the community and doing what you believe will help us to get ahead, because that's what really matters. You know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Tawana. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be in your podcast, and I look forward um, to future appearances or debates. Oh, I, I agree. We do need debates. And, and I, I believe, uh, I think you'll be a great host on, on, on that debate stage. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm here for it all. I'm here for it all. It's already in the works. I've been working on it since last week, since I thought about it. Awesome. So I look forward to seeing you again, Saeed. Thank you, Lisa, for setting this up. Everybody, Tawana B. and Saeed, not your normal conversation. He's running for Boston City Council at large. If you feel like he's the right person for the seat, vote for him. If not, there'll be more to come. You guys have a blessed evening, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Tawana. Okay, take care, Saeed.